Welcome to the uh, number six lecture of the six number six week, the course in machine learning. Uh, the theme of this lecture is Hebbian learning and associative uh, memory. So, as you can see uh, from the map of the lectures this week, we have now left uh, the mainstream of work on artificial neural networks, the free four uh, networks and recurrent neural networks, and turn to uh, another category uh, of systems, which can best be characterized by the term associative memory. But we will first turn to something more specific, which we call Hebbian learning. Hebbian learning theory is a neuroscientific theory claiming that an increase in synaptic efficacy arises from a presynaptic cell's repeated and persistent stimulation of a postsynaptic cell. This theory was introduced by Donald Hebb in his 1949 book, The Organization of Behavior. The theory is also called Hebb's rule, Hebb's postulate, or cell assembly theory. Hebb expressed himself as follows. Let us assume that the persistence or repetition of a reverberator activity tends to induce lasting cellular changes that add to its stability. When an axon of cell A is nearly enough to excite a cell B and repeatedly or persistently takes part in firing it, some growth process or metabolic change takes place in one or both cells such that the efficiency of A as one of the cells firing B is increased. Actually, as it turns out, neuron A has to fire slightly before B to, uh, and not fully in parallel to manifest the causality relation. So this elaboration of Hebb's work is called spike timing dependent plasticity. What is then Hebbian learning in an artificial neural network? The theory is often summarized as cells that fire together, wire together. It's an attempt to explain synaptic plasticity, the ad adaption of brain neurons during the learning process. In an ANN setting, the plasticity implements its adaption of weights. So Hebb's law can be represented in the form of two rules. If two neurons on either side of a connection, synapse, are activated synchronously, then the weight of that connection is increased. If two neurons on either side of a connection, read synapse, are activated asynchronously, then the weight of that connection is decreased. So Hebb's law provides the basis for unsupervised learning. Learning here is a local phenomena occurring without any feedback from the environment. Let's turn now to what we call the Hebbian learning algorithm. So first, there is always an initialization. So the synaptic weights and the threshold is set to small random values in the interval 0 to 1. Then we have the step of activations where we compute the postsynaptic neuron output from the presynaptic input elements uh, denoted here as x uh, uh, i j um, from the data item xj and j here denotes uh, the the number of the training instance data item uh, considered while i is one of the elements of the this input vector so actually the the output from the postsynaptic uh, neuron yj is um, one if the sum of um, of the input times the weight on the input connection minus t, where t is the threshold, is larger or equal to zero. If not, yj is zero. So after that, that the output value of the postsynaptic neuron is calculated, one can go to step three, which is the learning phase. And the learning follows the, something called the activity product rule, which captures the essence 
of the Hebbian theory. Uh, so here we update the weights in the network and the weight correction is determined by this so-called activity product rule, which says that the, the new weight in that is going to be applied in iteration j plus 1 uh, is equal to the old plus a term, which is alpha, which is a learning rate parameter, uh, as already commented in a kind of damping factor uh, that can be between 0 and 1 multiplied by the new calculated value of the post synaptic neuron times the input value uh, from the presynaptic input element. And after that, we start again. We choose a new uh, data item and the same procedure is repeated. Let us now look at an example. Uh, of this uh, algorithm. So we have a neuron with four presynaptic inputs, x1 to x4. We have weights on the connections for those inputs. We have an output from the postsynaptic neuron y. We, we assume a threshold of two. We assume a learning rate of one, and we initiate the weights, all the weights, to uniformly to all of them to one. And then we will now look at two training instances, one zero one zero one zero one zero, and look at how the calculations are uh, made. As you can see here, we have instantiated the inputs to the first. Uh, elements of the first training instance. We have the predefined weights. We have we, what we do now is this first iteration we we, we, we we call zero, and then we have a learning rate of one, and we have a threshold of two. So the first thing is we do is we use the force formula for y, and uh, and uh, uh, create the sum. Uh, uh, so as you see here. Uh, what we do is we sum the input values with, with, with the appropriate uh, weight values and uh, then we subtract with the threshold. And in this case, it gives you zero, but as, as this fulfills the first criteria, uh, we can output uh, one. Um, so that's the first step. So now we have an output value. So then we, we are in the position that we can calculate uh, uh, the weight update. So we calculate the delta weight, which, uh, which is the actually the learning rate uh, times the new value of y times the input values on the various input variables. So as you can see, this gives us 1, 0, 1, 0. And uh, if we add that to the old weight, we get the new weights to 1, 2, 1. As the Second data item for the second iteration is identical to the first. The calculation looks structurally very, very similar. We still get an output of one. We update the weights. But what we can see, and I think this is the only interesting observation on this slide, uh, is that uh, in the cases where we uh, have a synchronous activation, both of the presynaptic and the postsynaptic, equal to one in this case, then we further strengthen, strengthen uh, the weight of that connection, which is actually consistent with uh, the Hebbian theory. And I want to say a few words about associative memory. In psychology, associative memory is defined as the ability to learn and remember the relationship between unrelated items. This could include, for example, remembering the name of someone or the aroma of a particular perfume or any other sensory impression. Associative memory is declarative memory structure and often episodically based. A normal associative memory task involves the testing persistence on the recall of pairs of unrelated items such as face, 
name pairs. But in the realm of, of human psychology, uh, associative memory is, is obviously a very wide term. When we turn to artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, the term gets more precise. So in these two areas, associated memory refers to a broad class of memory structures uh, with mechanisms for storage and recall that can handle general patterns and pattern matching. Theoretically, all kinds of structures and data types should be able to be handled in the same system. There is also a clear coupling uh, to the area of content addressable memory, so-called CHEM techniques, which is a more classical core area of computer science. So, so for associative, associative memory in the computer science setting, on the one end of the spectrum, there are memorization of specific objects and situations and recall of these based on detailed but still partial or noisy descriptions. In the other end of the spectrum, there are analogical reasoning where structurally similar but domain unrelated patterns can be recalled. Domain-wise, uh, you can get something back uh, that is from a different realm, but it's, it's still in some structural way similar to your query, so to say. In the, in the middle, there are case-based reasoning where separate uh, patterns can trigger recall of larger patterns. So central concepts in associative memory are similarity me measures, spatial or temporal, and other topological aspects of the pattern space, like valleys, hills, basins. Optimality criteria and aspects of the search page, like local minima, maxima, attractors, etc. Ideally, one could say that one wants an associative memory system that has as many stable, well-separated local minimas as one has memories to store. So we have two forms of associative memory. One is called auto-associative memory. And in auto-associative memory, could also be called auto-association memory, auto-associated networks. It's any type of memory that enables one to retrieve a more complete object descriptions from a partial description. So in more technical terms, the input and output vectors have exactly the same form. So it only said that x, y, and I, a, y has the same form uh, for the vectors x and y. So as you can see an example to the right, we have a uh, the partial descriptions of a particular object that there are details missing or there are noise. But what you can retrieve is the full <coughs> uh, description or full picture of that object. So these concrete examples are typical are restoration of imagery like this one or the restoration of speech fragments. The other category of associative memory is called heteroassociative memory. So here uh, on the other hand, one can retrieve not only object descriptions of the same form, but potentially also a wider range of patterns, still satisfying some measure of similarity with respect to a partial description. <coughs> so in terms of vectors, the input vector x and the output vector y can have very different forms. So uh, as a, an example related to the above, Assume we, we have as input a, a key, <clears throat> and what we can retrieve is, is the situation around the application of a key, which is actually part of a door and a lock where, where the key is applied. Let me say a few words about some key concepts here. <clears throat> uh, I will talk about three things mainly something called attractors, something called basins, and something called bifurcations. So, an attractive Attractor is a state toward which other states in the region evolve in time. Similarly, each attractor has a basin, which is a surrounding region in state space, such that all trajectories starting in that region end up in the attractor sooner or later. Uh, so you can see that illustrated in three wa uh, ways to the right, three different kind of images that illustrate that fact. The basins belong to different attractors are separated by a narrow boundary, which can have a very irregular shape. The appearance of such a boundary separatory is called a bifurcation. 
For initial positions close to the boundary, small fluctuations can push the system either into the one or into the other basin, and therefore either finally into either the one or the other attractor. So close to the boundary, the system behaves chaotically, but inside the basin it moves predictably towards its attractor. Ideally, as already been said, one wants an uh, associative memory system that has many well-separated basins as one, have, uh, one has memories to store. So uh, this was the end of the, this lecture. Thanks for your attention. The next lecture, 6.7, will be on the topic Hockfield Networks and Boltzmann Machines. Thank you. Goodbye.